لكن تحديت الظروف وخذتها وحدي صبورا مستعينا بالصلاة كم مرة عصف الأنين بداخلي كم مرة قد ذاك قلبي من أساء محرمتها وكم كرهت مصابها بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The sun was out perfectly while I was setting up and then now winds have come and the sun has disappeared SubhanAllah uh, That's living in Great Britain for you But before starting the video I'd like to issue a quick disclaimer May Allah bless you all and May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve you and your families I've been on record highlighting and voicing my uh, differences with the Salafi Da'wah and Manaj as we see it today and that's no secret but as an athari there's many aspects of the the, the Salafi Da'wah and Manaj which I have complete agreement with and I've, sp I've spoken to many brothers that I know personally and even elders obviously that have uh, been in contact with me through the gr uh, through through obviously intermediaries um, and, and, and they're fully aware regarding my stances now what I am basically saying is this and without you know, making it a lengthy introduction is that I'm not saying every single Salafi or every aspect of the Salafi Da'wah and Manhaj is bad, is corrupt, is deviant. I'm not saying that at all. I, I don't think I've, uh, you know, mentioned that once explicitly, directly from my own mouth. Not at all. And as I've been an Athari, as I said just prior, I, a, lot of as a lot of the aspects of the Salafi Da'wah and Manhaj I agree with. But what we, what I'm saying well, what I'm stressing is that certain elements of the da'wah of today's Salafi, meaning the contemporary Salafi that we see today, okay? The extremists and the takfiris, which we could call them, have followed the principles of the early da'wah to Najdiya, okay? And have followed the early da'wah to Najdiya to an absolute T, okay? And they are forceful in condemning that extremist spectrum or that element of the Salafi da'wah, which they are Salafi, no one can take that away from them. And they don't condemn or they don't highlight or even admit, I think that's the word I'm looking for, that the early da'wah to Najdiya have fallen into extremes, have fallen into major errors when it comes to the application of takfir. Now takfir is part of the deen, right? Takfir is part of the deen. And it's the misapplication of takfir that we have a problem with. Okay? So this is hypocrisy. This is hypocrisy. And Nadariya, they claim Salafiyya or Wahhabiya because the early Da'wat al Najdiya were boastful of that title. And now we're finding that how the Salafi that was been directed, and there's another part of another video that I need to record showing how it's changed, and I, I'll, I'll touch on it in this video as well. The Nadariya aspect of claiming the Manhaj Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, Amaliyan is different. What we see manifested today. And the, the major scholars of the Salafi Da'wah, I have huge admiration for. Like, and for me, I have a soft spot for Ibn Uthaymin rahmatullah He is an, he is an alim bi ma'na al-kalima like He is an alim with the true essence of the meaning And you know, I've got plenty of books in, in my house uh, Shaykh al-Albani rahmatullah I highly revere And Shaykh bin Baz rahmatullah So, was if, and this is where the Salafi Da'wah need to really And those uh, subscribers too, need to understand that If I have a position which differs with them Don't start labeling me everything under the sun Deviant, Khariji, you know, Mubtadi'ah you know, all of neo Khariji as, as this uh, coward that hides uh, behind a camera doesn't want to show his face and we'll touch on him later. Muhammad Abdullah uh, had about six sons that from memory I remember and three of his sons, uh, Abdullah, Hassan and Hussein uh, were taught by him. So Abdullah was taught by him, Hassan was taught by him and Hussein was taught by him. Abdullah had a son, uh, Suleiman and Suleiman lived during that period. And he was ultimately responsible as well, obviously, for um, expanding or giving legitimacy for the expansion into Hijaz and obviously what subsequently happened with the massacres, he was also part in it as well and I'll prove that later. So as you can see on screen, he mentions Fa'awwalan, the first. He said, we will make clarity to you 
The reason why the book Ad-Dalail was written. Now, why was the book Ad-Dalail written? Okay, it was written because Fa'inna Sheikh Suleiman, the Sheikh Suleiman wrote this because of the attack from the, the Turkish military upon Najd in its in his time. Okay, in his time, and they wanted to exterminate the Deen from its root. They want to exterminate the religion. Look, look how they viewed themselves. They, they believed that they were the religion. So when the Turkish uh, military came to obviously deal with these bandits, okay, because they were bandits, no doubt about it, they viewed themselves as the only Muslims, so that they actually viewed their attack on them as trying to exterminate the religion. Subhanallah, look at that. And those groups that aided them from the people of Najd, from the al badia meaning the remote areas, the desert areas, and those who were hadir, those who were present as well in those areas. And they loved that they appeared, so they loved, so they, the, they claimed that those people of Najd loved for them to appear in order to destroy uh, or exterminate the religion from its root. When it comes to the takfiris of today, the true manifestation of the early Dawat al the ones that follow the actual principles and the methodology of the early Dawat al unlike you, um, Klazi, Takfiris, pseudo Salafis, you have no problem making videos, especially the coward from up north, the one that hides behind a pseudonym or hides behind a kunya. Videos upon videos highlighting the Takfiris and I don't care. Don't worry, we're going to get to you in another video. We've got plenty of videos planned for you. And when it comes to this issue, now the root, the source, the inspiration, they never come out and say, yeah, you know what, we agree that the, the source and the root, Muhammad Abdul Wahab did have extremism, did have, you know, takfiri tendencies. His legacy that we see today is, is basically um, the nittakfiriyun, you know, and we, we, we don't agree with Muhammad Abdul Wahab in this, this aspect of his da'wah, we're free from, etc. No, we don't hear that, but they've gone full onslaught against the takfiriyun. And that's why we're going to highlight that, okay, you got contradictions and your methodology, in its in its uh, manifestation today is actually a, a a bogus version it's a diluted version and someone has to call it out ice cream van <laughs> so what we're going to do now is we're going to show you the biography of Suleiman okay Suleiman so we're just going to show you who this man is according to the Najdiya how they viewed him because then you might try and say all right he was a son of Muhammad well, who is he okay let's go into this as you can see on screen we've got Dural Sunniya and he mentions Al-Sheikh Suleiman bin Abdullah bin Sheikh Rahimahullah. So he's Suleiman, the, sh the son of Abdullah, the son of the Sheikh, meaning Muhammad Abdul Wahab. Huwa al-Hafidhu, al-Muhadithu, al-Faqihu, al-Mujtahidu. So he's a, a, a he's member of the Quran, he's a Muhaddith, he's a Faqih, and he's a Mujtahid. And he mentions he's the crown of his era, uh, you know, beautified of his time. And Sheikh Suleiman ibn Sheikh Abdullah ibn Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. Wuli the Sana Alpha Miatain that he was born in the year 1200. Okay, so he was born uh, seven years before Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab died. So he was seven years old when Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab died. So a child. And he mentions that he was basically knowledgeable, uh, intelligent. Uh, he knew, you know, uh, hadith, you know, in, in its completeness and its and its men and its, uh, you know, its authenticity. I mean, in Sahih and its Hassan and its Daif. So he knew all the um, the classifications of hadith. And he carries on. He, you know, he's a faqih. He knew tafsir. He knew nahu. And he knew the men of hadith, etc., uh, etc. Et and he took knowledge from his father, uh, from his uncle, okay, uh, Sheikh Hussein. So the brother of. Abdullah, the other son of Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, and Sheikh Ali, and he also took knowledge from who? Sheikh Hussein ibn Ghannam, the author of Tariq al-Najd. So he also took knowledge from him as well, okay? And he also took knowledge from Abdullah ibn Fadil, okay? And I think he was the one that went to a tribe uh, to teach them Akam and Tawheed. Uh, I'll put it up, I'm sure it's in Sheikh Abdullah ibn Fadil, and then six months later they become Murtadun. Uh, and they went and slaughtered them and pillaged them. How did they become Murtadun after six months? After Muhammad ibn Abdullah sent this guy, I think he was, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it from memory, so if I'm wrong, please forgive me. Sheikh Abdullah bin Fadi taught them the Akam and Tawheed. So how could they become Murtadun after six months just like that? How? How? Because, like I said, they, it was a politically motivated. And Sheikh Abdul Rahman ibn Khamis, and Sheikh Abdullah al Gharib, and Sheikh Muhammad ibn Ali al Shawkani. Okay? 
and he got ijazah from Sheikh Muhammad bin Ali al Shawkani. So now you've got an understanding of who this man is, okay? So uh, at least you know why he wrote the book and his biography as well. So we've covered this individual, Suleiman, is, is not an average person in the uh, eyes of the early Da'wat al Najdiyya, okay? They don't quote him. Very rarely you find that today's Najdis quote this guy. Why? Because they deep down accept that he had takfiri tendencies. I'm not calling him Khariji. I'm not even calling Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab a Khariji, by the way. Not once. And I don't believe that's the case as well. So in 1220, I think it was Saud bin Abdul Aziz bin Muhammad bin Saud went westwards to Mecca. And they entered into Mecca with absolute barbarity. And Saud, when he entered, okay, got the, the ulama of Mecca to write a letter. And obviously it was coerced, but we'll get to that letter later to show you the mindset and the verdicts from behind, meaning the religious, religious legitimacy for this blank, blanket and chain takfir came from the likes of Suleiman ibn Abdullah ibn Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. So where's my proof that he was involved? And where's my proof that when they entered Mecca, he was part of the delegation. So as you can see on screen, we've got the book Mashahir Ulama Najd. Okay, the famous scholars of Najd and other than them. Okay, and this was written by Abdul Rahman Abdul Latif ibn Abdullah Al Sheikh. So in a nutshell, he mentions Al Imam Saud ibn Abd Al Aziz ibn Muhammad bin Saud sent Suleiman along along with some judges to assist uh, the judges of the path, meaning the Ottoman uh, judges, and to make them affirm and accept uh, Imam Saud ibn Abdul Aziz to take over Mecca. And he says, after what? Ba'dama wa istawla alayha wa dhakra ibn Bishr. After they took it over, now how did they take it over? And Ibn Bishr mentioned that the Sheikh Suleiman, he stayed in Mecca for a period of time. Okay, then he returned back to Ad-Dar'iyya. He went back to ad Now let's play Abdurrahman Hassan when he mentioned when they took over Mecca. And the majority of the Saudi Peninsula, I mean the Arabian Peninsula, was taken by the Sheikh and his students. The only place they didn't have control over was Mecca and Medina. Because they entered into Mecca and Medina and they took over بعد وفاة الشيخ when the Sheikh died. So the majority of the Arabian Peninsula had now fallen under the banner of Tawheed. Shirk was destroyed. Okay, so Abdurrahman Hassan mentioned, you know, uh, they took it over بعد وفاة الشيخ after the Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdul Wahab died and um, you know they took over the Arabian Peninsula and it was free from shirk etc etc so even Bishan now is explaining how they took over Mecca remember Abdurrahman Hassan uh, they took over Mecca but how did they take it over like they don't want to they miss out the details it says وَأَمَّا مَكَّةَ فَالْأَمْرُ فِيهَا أَعْظَمُ مِمَّا ذَكَرْنَا بِسَبَبِ الْحَرْبِ وَالْحِصَارِ that as for the situation in Mecca, its matter was more greater that we mentioned, and he mentioned what the, the famine that took place in Najd and Timama uh, and, and Yemen, etc. As because of the Harb and Hisar, and obviously stopping and cutting off supplies, etc. So what happened? And it says they stopped or they blocked off the pathways from Mecca, from the angle of Yemen and Tihama. Wal Hijaz, Wal Najd. So they blocked off all of those areas. Okay. Now, why did they block it off? They blocked it off because they believed that the people of Mecca were Mushrik and they were Murtaddun. And as I said before, they made blanket and chain to feed on those areas. You'll see as well in another video. I'll show you it. Because what I want them to do is make excuses first and then we'll smack them with evidences later to show you, well, okay, this is what you said, but look at the reality. So that's going to be left for another video. And he says, because all of them were under the command of Ibn Saud, meaning uh, Saud uh, Ibn Abdul, Abdul Aziz. And in a nutshell, they, the situation was terrible. And they forced them to eat dogs, okay, because of the siege. They, they cut it off supplies, they couldn't get in, they besieged it. And loads of people died, okay, because of starvation. That they died because of hunger. So look what they contributed to the destruction and the killing and the starvation of the people of Mecca. To add as well, have sieges happened in the past amongst Muslims? Yes, we agree. And this 
what we call fitna obviously due to territory we don't condone it and this has been happening since the dynasties after the Umayyad, Abbasid, Ayyubid, Mamalik and then the Uthmaniyun it happened the, the, the Najdiyah for 70 years or 60 years before this slaughtered all the Arabian tribes and besieged them and slaughtered them and killed them and took their properties and did all sorts for them for 60 years prior to this it's nearly a decade nearly a century they were doing this 70 years obviously before they were destroyed so you can't compare the two you can't compare the two at all they declared them as apostates they had, their blood was halal did the Mamalik even if you agree that they made um, obviously uh, the Ottomans or declared them as or the Ottomans declared the Mamalik as, as Murtadun did they go around looting their property and killing all the inhabitants there and, and, and starving them to death meaning that they gave it religious legitimacy to slaughter the inhabitants as well so you can't compare the two and they won't call this out now this is the main bit now uh, up after obviously we're going to go into the uh, the Gulf War and the fatwa that Bin Baz gave Allah Irhamu Suleiman now obviously infuriated okay with the um, catastrophe the first you know that with the the state of the Dawla was destroyed and now this is brought about anger and resentment and frustration for those Arabian tribes that aided the Ottomans okay in helping them you know taking back the territory so he wrote a book called Ad-Dala'il as I mentioned in Durar Saniya explaining that the reason why and I'm just going back into it so I just want to quote it properly the reason why is because many of those Arabian tribes um, somehow supported uh, the uh, Ottomans and then the ulama of Najna, so Suleiman is after this now, he's writing this. And there's another book that was written after as well, we're going to get to in another video. So, he wrote a book called Ad-Dala'il, and as you can see on screen, it's called Ad-Dala'il. For those who, uh, the ruling upon those who gave assistance to the, the, the Turks, okay? And then he wrote another uh, passage in the book, we'll get to that in another video, about those who travel uh, to the Bilad al-Shirk, okay, Bilad al-Shirk, and Hamd bin Atayq, another uh, uh, takfiri, a hardcore, you know, takfiri, he wrote a book as well, dedicated to that, okay, and we'll get to it, so they viewed, and coming back to me now, before I go into it, they viewed all of the territories of the Ottomans to be Bilad al-Mushrikeen and Dar al-Kufr, all of the territories of the Ottomans. Now, the coward up north uh, had an issue with the <laughs> it's just so ridiculous and amazing how they're falling over their faces not to label Muhammad Abdul Habib Takfiri and a radical and those after him his bandits it's simple just accept that but they'll go over and they'll sort of argue and you know focus their energy on the takfiris of today but where's the root and the source where are they getting this from where are they getting like Neo Khawarij? Alright, then if they are Neo Khawarij, coward from up north, they are Neo Khawarij. The danger from the jihadiyya, the Neo Khawarijiyya, is real. So what are the early da'wah to Najdiyya then? I'm just trying to understand your logic here. Okay, so we'll accept Qa'ida, Dawa'ish, Boko Haram are Neo Khawarij. Okay, let's just accept that. No problem. They're Neo Khawarij. So if they're Neo Khawarij, what are the early da'wah to Najdiyya and Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab? What are they then? Don't they fall under the same category? And if you say no, I'll ask you why not? Because Ibn Abadin, as you can see on screen, in his book, he, because of what he heard, he was in a sham, he declared Muhammad bin Abdul Hab and his followers to be from the Khawarij. Because think about it, they went around slaughtering the people for 70 plus years, and that is one of the traits of the Khawarij, the traits from the, the Sifat, Minas Sifat. Okay? Anyway, so let's go into this book now. It's 25 evidences he presented in this chapter. Ad-Dala'il meaning giving evidences. So 25 evidences he presented, but I just want to go to one of them. So the introduction. So let's go into the introduction. He mentions, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I'lam rahimakullah. Anna al-insana ida adhara lil mushrikeen al muwafaqa ala deenihim. Khawfan minhum. He mentions that, no, may Allah have mercy upon you. That if a person makes or shows a displays to the mushrikeen, now, the mushrikeen here are not the mushrikeen al-asli, meaning the original mushriks. He's referring to the Ottoman Empire. We'll show you from Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab and how the students understood it. Agreeing with their religion, you see, agreeing with their religion. Out of fear for them, okay? Out of fear for them. Then he further mentions, and having sort of 
you know, like friendship with them. You kind of give them legitimacy, okay? Or you compromise uh, their evil, okay? فَإِنَّهُ كَافِرٌ That he is a kafir like them, okay? Even if he hates his religion, okay? Or dislikes their religion and hates them, okay? And he loves Islam and the Muslims. And he loves Islam and the Muslims. Okay. And I'll leave you on screen. Okay. It's lengthy. So you get the gist that any people that aided the Ottomans, okay, even if they did Arafia and he had like kind of companionship with them and he justified it for them, etc., then he's a kafir like them as well. Even if he, did, if he doesn't like their religion and he hates them and he loves Islam and the Muslims. And then he further goes on to mention that if he aids them, if he gives them Nusra, okay, and wealth, etc. And he kind of allies himself with them. And he kind of cuts off the alliance and agreement between himself and the Muslims. So you see, they were the only Muslims. Becomes the soldier. Look at this. He becomes a, uh, from the Junood of what? Of Shirk and the Qibab of the Don'ts. And its people. After he was a soldier of Ikhlas and Tawheed and its people. So coming back to me now before we go into the evidences. So you see the rhetoric right there. What is the difference between this rhetoric here and the Takfiriyun? That's what I like to ask the cow from up north. What is the difference? So why are you focusing all your energy on the Takfiriyun? Rightfully so. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But then... When we present the video against you, you see how your language changes. We see how you just basically kind of sugarcoat or gloss, not even gloss, but just completely overlook the catastrophes, the catastrophes and the atrocities that they committed. Anyway, now let's get to the evidence that they use, okay? As you can see on screen. Samura bin Jundub narrates that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man al mushrika wa sakana ma'ahu fa innahu mithluhu That whoever goes to the mushrik or joins the mushrik and lives amongst them or lives with them for indeed he is from them so this is the evidence he's presenting he says فَجَعَلَ صَلَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فِي هَذِهِ الْحَدِيثِ مَنْ جَامَعَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ that whoever he made the evidence that whoever joins the mushrik اي اجتمع معهم that he basically unites with them and mixes with them Okay, and lives with them, he is from amongst them. فَكَيْفَ بِمَنْ أَظْحَرَ لَهُمَ الْمُوَافَقَ عَلَى دِينِهِمْ وَآوَاهُمْ وَعَانَهُمْ That he mentions that, then how is it, okay, then how is it about the one that basically makes apparent his agreement or shows them agreement regarding their religion and gives them support an assistant. For in Qalu, and if they say, we feared, Qayla lahum, say to them, Kadabtum, you have lied. Now you can see inside their heart. Okay, you can see inside their heart. Or could it be that they were getting slaughtered for 70 years and they thought, you know what, we need to get rid of this. You know, this is extremism and they could have a, a ta'wil, their interpretation, so, you know, Udr bi ta'wil. Wa aydun, falaysa al khawf bi udrin. He says that Suleiman is saying that. You should say to them, you have lied, and fear is not an excuse. Okay, it's not an excuse. Hope is not an excuse, according to the Najdiyah. Then he presents a verse from the Quran and says, from amongst the people who say, we believe in Allah. Okay, so we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if they were to basically be harmed, um, obviously, for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, they consider this a fitna then he quotes the end of the verse that says ja'ala fitnatan nasi ka'adabillah that they have made the fitna of the people or mankind as an adabillah as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially man is explaining now he says falam yu'dhar tabarak wa ta'ala he's explaining that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give an excuse for the one that basically leaves off his religion due to hawf okay due to being fear etc and how about the one okay 
who has not been, you know, harmed with any fear or with any harm, etc., but goes to evil, batil, uh, and, and this is where I don't really get. Why would he go to batil? Because of his love for it and fear and, you know, fearing calamities, etc. So now we've got a benchmark from the Dawud al that they don't classify fear as an excuse, okay? Fear as an excuse. Uh, and again, this ain't the Yahud, the one Nasara, one Mushrikeen. Again, the Ottoman Empire were Muslims. Yes, you know, they had issues at the end, but the population as a whole, if they now believe that they were Muslims because of the apparent, you know, the, like, as the Adhan is there, the, 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 the Kurt is obviously collected, you know, the Salat is performed. All of these things, obviously, again, we'll get into what's Darul Islam and Darul Kufr according to Ibn Taymiyyah and others. So, what I'm saying now is, is their blood justified the Arabian tribes? Because they sided with the Ottomans. They, they, they now declared them as apostates and their blood is lawful. And as Ibn Taymiyyah said in Bugiyatul Murtad, and I'm quoting at the top of my head, that Takfir is Hukum Shari. And it makes your blood you know, lawful and your property is lawful. And basically be careful with it. And if you're in doubt, stop, don't make, issue takfir. Okay? Especially when the awam are jail, etc. So look at the early da'wah to Najdiyah. They were rendering people apostates and slaughtering them. And that's when they went to Mecca. That's why they starved them. And that's why they obviously, um, you know, forced them for, uh, until they ate dogs. Because they believe they were mushriks and murtadun. Okay? So, so, before we get into the Gulf War, let me just show you that the early Da'wat al because this is why it's called Ibn Baz, Rahmatullah versus the early Da'wat al Look at the extremism. So, like I said before, the focus and the energy against the Takfiriyun, to me, is hypocritical. For me, it's double standards. For me, it's absolute um, bogus. This is just a front. And they, in essence, closet takfiris. I'm talking about these ones on social media, especially the, the, cl uh, the closet takfiri up north, the plastic najdi um, from up north. Anyway, as you can see on screen, we've got Durar al again. We've got Durar al again. And he mentions, was uh, al Sheikh, that they asked the Sheikh, or the Mashaykh, uh, Muhammad bin Abdul Latif, was Sheikh Suleiman bin Sahman, was Sheikh Saleh bin Abdul Aziz. So it's not just Abdullah, there were others as well. Was Sheikh Muhammad bin Ibrahim bin Abdul Latif. And the rest of the ulama of al-arid meaning al-najd about the tribes of al-ujman what the way and those who follow them so not just them because they left the lands of the muslims and they claimed that they were following you know on the path of ja'far ibn abi talib I mean the brother of ali anhu, when and his companions anhum, and when they left from mecca as immigrants to habasha so how did they answer these are the mashaykh and all of the al-arid the early da'wah of Najdiyah فَأَجَابُوا هَاُولَاءِ الَّذِينَ ذَكَرَهُمُ السَّائِلِ That answer That those who the questioner was asking about From the Ujman and the Dawaj and those who follow them So it's not restricted to those two tribes لَا شَكَّ فِي كُفْرِهِمْ وَرِدَّتِهِمْ There's no doubt that they are kuf, that of their Kufr and their Ridda Of their apostasy Because they went to the enemies of Allah and His Messenger And they requested to enter under their leadership and they saw aid from them and they it's gathered now between leaving from the land of the Muslims and clinging on to the enemies of the Millah with Deen meaning the Ottomans and takfir of the people of Islam now that's utter rubbish it's the other way around they were making takfir of everyone else and making their blood halal and their wealth okay etc so there's absolutely no proof that the uh, that the tribes, the Arabian tribes, made takfir of the Da'wah to Najdiyah. Okay, unless they believe that when they were called Khawarij, that's takfir, that necessitates takfir, but not necessarily. Uh, the, the majority of the ulama believe that the Khawarij were Muslims. Okay, they were Muslims, they were from Ahl al Bidah. Okay, well, that's another thing altogether. So you see, La shakka fi kufrim wa riddatihim. There's no doubt of their kufr and their ridda. Wow, that's, that's, that's extreme. If that's not extremism, what is? Subhanallah al Adim. And focusing your energy on the takfiriyun, okay, the coward from uh, up north, okay, focusing your energy on takfiriyun and making videos and, and speaking about them, but then conveniently ignore the root and the source of the takfiriyun. So if you're going to label them neo khawarij like I said before, and then neo khawarij like Daesh and Qaeda and all the um, extremists, then what do you call and what do you label the early Da'wah after what you just read? 
you follow an absolute diluted bogus version bogus let's be honest and you've been taken for an absolute fool well you are a fool anyway but let's carry on now now the main part of the video now is referring to the fatwa now so you see the early doubt on his principles okay and we're not just taking any abstract evidences we're showing you i could show you a lot more as well uh, in future videos but one can say that the fatwa that bin baz rahmatullah gave was incorrect and Shaykh al-Albani rahmatullah as you can see on screen he also disagreed with it many of the ulama disagreed with it so it's not you know haji uh, you know a nobody in birmingham and I say, I'm, I'm, I'm a nobody, you know, I'm just a simple brother from Birmingham. You know, who are you to disagree with the Sheikh? Well, he's not infallible, I can. Like Muhammad Abdul Wahab, he's not infallible, I can. And this is what it is, they've monopolized uh, that Tawheed is, you know, rooted in the early Da'wat al So if you oppose the early Da'wat al by extension, you oppose Tawheed or you've, uh, you're against Tawheed. This is rubbish and this is absolutely nonsense. So, you know, you're not going to bully us no longer, I assure you. I assure you. All right. So... Backdrop regarding the Gulf War, okay, and it could be more expansive, uh, but in a nutshell, okay, let me have some water, Bismillah. In a nutshell, okay, Saddam Hussein, and he was a tyrant, no doubt about it, uh, and I could say, may Allah have mercy upon him, no doubt about it, you know, I believe he died a Muslim from what was apparent, may Allah have mercy upon him, but he was a tyrant, no doubt about it, throughout his life, he was a tyrant absolute tyrant and he committed many uh, atrocities that one cannot excuse so just to get that out there as well but his ending you know may Allah have mercy upon him and forgive him for his uh, atrocities the Gulf War started when Iraq or before it started shall I say uh, invaded into Kuwait and this was aggression and this was more domestic between Iraq and Kuwait so he inv invaded into Kuwait and he settled his troops there so what happened was um, Saudi Arabia started panicking and they believed they were next or they believed that Saddam Hussein was going to attack and enter into their territory now I say this clearly these tyrant rulers will slaughter the whole world and whoever's in it to preserve their throne let's just put it out there and they'll give re religious legitimacy for that 500,000 american personnel to enter into jazirat al-arab the arabian peninsula desecrating uh, the jazirat al-arab now before i start okay before i start what i want to show you is how precious muslim life is and what are the objectives of the Sharia? What are the maqasid of the Sharia? Now, as an alim, when you're faced with a predicament, you have to have an overview of the maqasid of the Sharia. Now, remember, Saddam Hussein, they made takfir of, but are you saying by extension that the population of kuffar? Because now that you made takfir of him, then obviously by extension you made takfir of his army. So, if you made takfir of Saddam before, be, be, for being a ba uh, uh, from among the Bahthiya, and there were other uh, uh, leaders are uh, from the Bahthiya as well. Uh, conveniently, they weren't made takfir of, and we'll get to that, you know, uh, shortly. As you can see on screen, we've got the book Al Muwafaqat by Imam Shatabi. Okay, Imam Shatabi, rahmatullah And he mentions, فقد اتفقت الأمة بل سائر الملل. So he mentions that that the agreement from the Ummah على أن الشريعة وضعت للمحافظات على الضروريات الخمس that the Sharia was placed to preserve five uh, objectives, meaning necessities first one, وهي الدين first the religion needs to be preserved the necessity, okay of the preservation of religion okay والنفس, life Okay, life needs to be preserved. It's daruriyat. Okay, is from the amongst the daruriyat. Number three, wal naslu, lineage. Number four, wal malu, wealth. And number five, wal aklu wa ilmuha inda al ummati kadaruriya. So there you go. So you've got the uh, the ob objectives of the Sharia, the necessity of the objectives of the Sharia, which is the preservation of religion, life. Okay. Uh, lineage, uh, wealth, and intellect. Okay, so 
bearing in mind that there's a fitna that's brewing, okay, in Kuwait. We've got Madawi al Rashid, okay, in her book, A History of Saudi Arabia. When she explains it, she goes all the way from the start and all the way to like <laughs> for the late 90s. She mentions, subhanAllah al Adib, she mentions. Here we go. I'll read it first and I'll present it to you. It says, the Gulf War and its aftermath, 1990 to 2000. So she's obviously discussing that. Two major challenges faced the Saudi government in the 1990s. Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait on the 2nd of August 1990 proved to be problematic, not only for the Kuwaitis, but also for their, for their Saudi neighbours. Okay? The war was an unprecedented event in that for the first time, Saudi Arabia felt that it was under imminent threat of invasion by a neighbouring Arab state. Okay, so that's what uh, Saudi Arabia believes. So obviously, Kuwait is in the Gulf, isn't it? So it's ne next to Saudi Arabia. Now, look what Madawi Rashid, a senior lecturer in the social anthropology at King's College, University of London. Okay, so she's obviously well versed in this. And she says, although an annexation of Saudi Arabia by the Iraqis was highly unlikely, okay, weren't going to happen. It was highly unlikely. The Saudi government and the United States could not rule out the possibility of military action near the important oil fields of the eastern province. Okay, so America, okay, America, okay, I'm going to get to their history as well to show you, was it really a wise move to call them with their history prior to this? The liberation of Kuwait became a priority for the Saudis, not only to restore the exiled Kuwaiti ruling family to government, but also push, also to push the Iraqi army beyond its imminent, imminent borders, immediate borders. Sorry. Saudi Arabia became the territory from which the liberation of Kuwait was to take place. The li this liberation was dependent on the assistance of American troops under the umbrella of a multinational force. So remember, the Saudis, when they announced or gave the fatwa uh, to um, legitimize, uh, to desanctify, to desecrate the Arabian Peninsula, uh, they were under the banner of the multinational force. Okay, so they weren't in control. Okay, so they gave complete authority. Okay, to the NATO force. This important development brought about King Fahd's second problem: the strengthening of Islamist opposition immediately after the Gulf War. And then this is where Sheikh Rabi and their likes came in. So this is where the the Salafi Dawah, that was the Salafi, took a drastic change after this. And we're going to go into it in another video. And there was another problem as well that they faced, which resulted in this diluted version we see today. The causes of the Islamist opposition predated the Gulf War, but the war itself was a catalyst that the opposition used to voice their general dis discontent with their government over important issues. So it was brewing before that, okay, uh, TV stations and, you know, there were other things as well that resulted in like, you know, the, uh, the Islamists, as they like to call them, you know, having an issue with the uh, Saudi government. But let's bring it forward because then you can read it because I can't put the... Uh, it on screen so there you go there it is there so there's the Gulf War here you go up so I just place it there just read that a bit okay, and then move up there you go so up to there there's more there's more but you know uh, so you go Madawi Rashid okay so it won it was highly unlikely that the Iraqis would have actually invaded into Saudi Arabia. It was highly unlikely. And it was basically um, Uncle Sam whispering into the Saudi's ears and you know the, the creation of the Third Saudi State obviously with the, their involvement with uh, <laughs> Western powers because they basically created them um, was nothing new. Before I get into the catastrophic implications of this fatwa, who did they seek assistance from? They sought assistance from America. Do you know the history of America? Of their brutal campaigns in other countries prior to Iraq okay so let's give you one example okay which is very well known on August 6th 1945 during World War II 1939 to 1945 an American B-29 bomber dropped the world's first deployed atomic bomb over the Japanese city of Hiroshima Hiroshima I think it's called the explosion immediately killed an estimated 80,000 people tens of thousands more would later die of radiation exposure three days later a second b-29 dropped another a bomb on Nagasaki killed an estimated 40,000 people Japan's Emperor Hirohito announced the country's unconditional surrender in World War II in a radio address in August 15 citing the devastation power of a new and most cruel bomb okay and also as you can see on screen the New York Times mentioned uh, Vietnam so they also obviously uh, what how many 45 was it 1945 was it so 10 
20, uh, 22 years after um, they invaded into Vietnam many massacres happened there and there's a massacre of the uh, Mai Lai massacre in 1967 and there's there's full details you got to sign up and pay for that but already in other websites but I don't want to focus on that too much so as the Makas of the Sharia uh, the five Dururiyat okay the preservation of life etc so when the ulama of the senior the the, the Hayat Kibar al ulama that were discussing this uh, the Makas of the Sharia should have been taken into account and we're going to get into the devastation caused by the Gulf War as well and America's history in you know dropping you know atomic bombs and you know invasions in, in, in Vietnam and also Panama and also in other areas prior to this um, let's be honest it was an irresponsible fatwa to allow uh, you know the Americans into Jazeera al Arab first and foremost you know we got prophetic narration that says expel them uh, and we'll show you about Bin Baz as well uh, rahmatullah alayhi, may Allah forgive him um, his fatwas uh, prior to this was upon that understanding so what happened what changed okay so let's look now as you can see on screen we've got Charles Kurzman okay uh, who wrote pro US fatwas okay now Dr. Kruzman teaches sociology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's an editor of Anthologies, Liberal Islam and Modernist Islam, 1840-1940, and author of The Unthinkable Revolution in Iran, 1977-1979, Harvard University. So he wrote a, um, a piece, an academic piece, talking about this particular um, issue. Now, he mentions regarding Bimbaz. Okay, rahmatullah alayh. When Iraqi troops overran Kuwait on August 2nd, 1990, Saudi Arabia may have been the next target. May have been the next target. Regardless of Saddam Hussein's action intentions, the Saudi monarchy felt threatened enough to invite US forces to serve as a deterrent. Okay, so they invited them. At the same time, the Saudi monarchy appears to have, be, to, to have worried that the presence of non-Muslim soldiers could, in, in unsympathetic eyes, be viewed as incompatible with the regime's self-proclaimed responsibility to protect the two holy mosques, the foundational sites of Islam in Mecca and Medina. King Fahad and other Saudi leaders convinced Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, convinced chairman of the Supreme Council of Ulama to issue a fatwa in support of the regime's decision. So they already made the decision, they just needed a fatwa for it. So he was used, let's be frank. May Allah forgive him, may Allah forgive him. Huge mistake and Sheikh Albani also was against this. Bin Baz and his colleagues did so given the need to defend the nation. By all possible means, the Supreme Council of Ulama supports what was undertaken by the ruler. May God grant him success. The bringing of forces equipped with instruments capable of frightening and terrorizing those who wanted to commit an aggression against his country. This duty is dictated by necessity in current circumstances. Okay, so Dorura. Okay. And made inevitable by the painful reality. And its legal basis and evidence dictates that the man in charge of the affairs of the Muslims should seek the assistance of the one who has the ability to attain the intended aim. The Quran and the Prophet Sunnah, or the Prophet Sunnah activities and statements, have indicated the need to be ready and take precautions before it's not before it's too late. So that's the justification he gave. So Charles Kurzman also mentioned the Saudis also solicited support from the Muslim World League, which gathered 350 Islamic scholars in Jeddah in early September 1990. After bus tours of Mecca and Medina showing visitors that non-Muslim troops were not stationed in these high sites the league issued a statement that backed the Saudi decision as a temporary emergency measure now listen to this when operation desert shield was transformed into operation desert storm switching the defense of Saudi Arabia to the reinstatement of the Asaba monarchy in Kuwait Bibad again issued a supportive fatwa so now another fatwa came because it changed from desert shield to desert storm the, the jihad that is taking place today against the enemy of God Saddam so he's an enemy of Allah Azza wa Jal the rule of Iraq is a legitimate jihad on part of Muslims and those assisting them. Those assisting them. It's a legitimate jihad for them as well. Okay. Bin Baz stated, for he has wrongly transgressed and committed ang aggression against and invaded a peaceful country. Therefore, it is obligatory to wage jihad against him, to expel him unconditionally from Kuwait, to assist the oppressed to restore justice and to deter the oppressor. Bin Baz was later promoted to chief mufti of the monarchy no doubt in part for his supporting the monarchy's alliance with the united states okay now what i want to do is show you sheikh bin Baz's stance before this according to charles kruzman and he said bin Baz's support for alliance with non-muslims was a departure listen to this from his usual position that muslims should avoid working or socializing with non-muslims in a series of statements on proper personal conduct now this is not just basically muamalat 
He mentions Bimbaz quoted the Quranic Surah, Surah 3, Al Imran, verse 118, described in the English version of Bimbaz collected fatwas. O oh, you believe, take not as your bitana, advisors, consul, consultants, protectors, helpers, friends, those outside your religion, pagans, Jews, Christians, and hypocrites, since they would not fail to do their best to corrupt. A more common approach considered this a similar verse is to refer to only to enemies in times of war. So this is to our enemies in times of war. Even more to the point, in response to a question about a non Muslim guest workers in Arabia, Bimbaz argued that their presence posed a great danger. So look at this now. May Allah forgive him. A great danger both to Muslim control of the central lands of Islam and to the personal faith of individual Muslims who might grow to become close to them and rely upon them, or even claim due to the whisperings of Satan to him, meaning the Muslim, that they are brothers in humanity. This is not correct, for brotherhood in faith is the true brotherhood, and as long as there is a difference in religion, there can be no brotherhood. Bimbaz quoted a statement of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, which we mentioned, Verily I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula, it till I leave none but... Now, it's clear from that, that Sheikh Bimbaz contradicted his whole stances. Personal mu'amalat, you know, dealing with like, maids or workers that come that are not muslims uh, that many uh, maids do come which are treated unjustly as well and that's obviously another topic um he was against it he was against just like workers coming like it, it corrupt you know and he used the hadith that the prophet Alaihi says said that expelled the jews and the christians from the arabian peninsula and that was just for the mu'amalat ma like you know like abu lu'lu al-mujusi la'natullah alayhi was allowed in Medina because of his need, because of or because of the need of his of his skills. So there was an exception made for that. So if you know non-Muslim maids, you know the Saudi families want maids to look after their children or workers or migrant workers, you know that could be a necessity. The way uh, Umar bin Khattab allowed Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi to you know work in Medina. Like uh, he was a slave of Mughayr bin Shu'ba. Now look how he changed. May Allah forgive him that he, the fatwa allowing 500,000 American personnel which continue to stay, we continue to have a presence in the Arabian Peninsula. Now, the, the kingdom could have issued a fatwa to allow Muslim armies from all over the world, you could have paid them, you know, to support the uh, defense against Saddam Hussein. Okay, that was, they could have done that. And they could have reinstated the Kuwaiti uh, monarchy themselves, you know, and look at who are they seeking aid from like those who have been involved in mass war crimes like you know america's been you know and the panama cuba el salvador uh, you name it where they haven't been you know vietnam japan like philippines like subhanallah and they're known for the brutality and you can see it now you know afghanistan 2001 2003 iraq on a, on a pretext of a, of a lie you know and it was irresponsible it was a fatwa that had damaging effects, which we are result, which we can w witness to this day that it was an irresponsible fatwa, and you know the rulers already made the decision, and, and the fatwa was given. Now, may Allah forgive him, and as I said, it's not an attack on the Sheikh. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, elevate his ranks, uh, you know, and may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, grant him uh, jannatul firdaus. I've got nothing against the Sheikh, so don't please, you know, perceive this to be like a hedge is going on and an all out attack against the Sheikh. No, you know, I, I admire him, I respect him, and this was a mistake, a, a, a very major mistake, and the consequences of this mistake we are witnessing today. So I just want to, you know, get that out there. We hear the Neo Salafis say when we talk about Khuruj, we say, they say it causes more harms, it causes more harms. Now what was the harms caused by this fatwa now? Okay. What was these harms caused, caused by this fatwa? I agree, you shouldn't do khuruj. It's best not to do it. You should avoid it at all costs. But at certain times, depending on the level of oppression, the degree of oppression, whether it's macro oppression or micro, you know, you have to assess your situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to defend ourselves. People don't know about this. So Human Rights Watch uh, did a report in 1991. And the violations caused needless deaths in the Gulf War, as you can see on screen. Uh, There's about four parts to it, but I'm just going to get to the main part. So let's go to the background and the main point. Uh, the view from the ground, eyewitness accounts of civilian casualties and damage. This chapter contains testimony about civi civilian casualties and damage taken by Middle East Watch from former residents of Iraq who fled during the war. The accounts are organized geographically beginning with Baghdad and Basra, Iraq's largest cities. Journalists report and information from post-war visitors to Iraq are cited when they corroborate accounts of eyewitnesses interviewed, witnesses interviewed by Middle East Watch or provide supplement, supplemental information. Most of the testimony included here was collected in February 1991 by Middle East Watch 
in random interviews with evacuees and others in Jordan. Additional accounts were obtained from the war from interviews Middle East Watch conducted in New York, London, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. We must emphasize that this testimony provides only a partial view, not a comprehensive accounting of civi civilian, civilian casualties and damage in Iraq during the air war. Moreover, as it is true throughout the report, the accounts in this chapter represent only some of the testimonies obtained by Middle East Watch. Accounts were omitted if details were sketchy or information was contradictory. Then he mentions, the Iraqi authorities told United Nations representatives who visited the country in March 1991 that about 9,000 homes housing some 72,000 people have been destroyed or badly damaged during the air war. Some 2,500 of the buildings were in Baghdad and another 1,900 1, in Basra. However, one member of a US delegation who visited Baghdad for four days after the war did not find physical evidence in the city to support the Iraqi government figures. After traveling around Baghdad, she concluded that the Iraqi figures were not credible. The air war, there were press reports that some of the allied attacks on bridges in Baghdad were flawed. In the bombing of the city for a 12 hour period look at that on the night of the of february the 6th to the 7th so imagine being bombed for a 12 hour period subhanallah for example the associated press reports that a missile hit houses in the uh, adhamiya neighborhood northwest of the city center during a midnight raid killing six the missile may have been intended for nearby ahmadiyya bridge over the tigris river some 200 yards away 107 one of the houses burnt to the ground in the attack was owned by a Kurdish family. They left Baghdad before the war began and I came back yesterday convinced nothing would happen. A man whose sister lived in one of those houses told AP two hours later five of them were dead. They were burnt alive. All the people who lived in the area around the bridge have collected their belongings and left for the countryside. And it mentions obviously that restaurants were destroyed, civilians were killed near Sarafia Bridge. Several two-story buildings with stores on the first floor residents were above, uh, above were damaged or destroyed on the first night of the war in Waziriya neighborhood just north of the city center. According to a Mauritanian student interviewed by Middle East Watch, he went to the neighborhood the morning after where he saw smoke rising fearful for his schoolmates who lived there. For human rights representative visited an old residential section in the city of Azubair. He saw severely completely destroyed homes around large bomb crater. Residents reported that the attack occurred at 10.30 p.m. On, the, on January the 18th. 17 were killed and another 15 injured in 10 houses. They said the doctors or the doctors in the town told PHR that approximately 200 civilians were killed and 3 to 400 injured during the war. And it carries on. Hospitals were destroyed, etc. Now, again, you could go, I'll put the link in the, uh, in the bio. You could read the report. It's a very lengthy report and it shows the needless deaths that were caused during the Gulf War. Now back to uh, the fatwa now. Look at the catastrophic effects and remnants of this fatwa and one can say that any such fatwa that is given which goes against the interest of the believers and I don't mean to say that what took place in Kuwait and what took place in other areas was not tyrannical. Saddam Hussein was a tyrant, I agree with that. But the Muslims could have dealt with this themselves. Saudi Arabia has plenty of cash. They could have paid countries and this would have been a fitna bain al muslimin okay? And this would have been resolved, okay, one way or another. To allow, you know, American bombs, allow American personnel to indiscriminately bomb you know Iraq for that long you know periods over 12 hours resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths uh, this was the outcome of the fatwa given by Sheikh bin Baz and may Allah forgive him so I just want to say that if you want to compare the early Dawat al Najdiya now to Ibn bin Baz imagine now that if the early Dawat and Najdi were here, Suleiman ibn Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was here, and Hamd ibn Atiq, and Abdul Latif uh, Ali Sheikh, and all those ulama of Arid wal Najd were here today and witnessed this fatwa, okay, or saw this fatwa, what would, they, what would their response be? What would their response be? Right? What would their response be? So that's why I say that there's a huge void between the early Dawat and and their principles of manhaj and what we see Salafiya in its true form today it's a heretical version and we're going to consistently highlight this because you have conveniently ignored this and to the coward up north you've got a lot of 
answers to give when our videos come out and there'll be plenty of videos because you've You've got so much hypocrisy in your videos. Uh, you know, you could be a spy for all I know. You could be an agent. I don't know who you are. Show your face. Show, give us your background. Give us a bit about yourself. Your name, your location, and maybe then we could trust you. But I can't trust you. And this is the point. You know, coward north. Uh, at the end of the day, can't do what I'm doing. You know, I don't fear the blame of the blamers. And as I said before, there's beautiful Salafi brothers who I respect and admire. Uh, and I don't need to mention their names and I'm talking to a few as well um, they understand exactly where I stand uh, and, and they, they have valid points that I agree with as well and I'm going to be talking to them more often uh, so this information uh, has been brought out due to your hypocrisy due to your um, aggression against other Muslims and not having consistency and there'll come a time that you're going to have to answer this and there's going to come a time that you're going to have to deal with these head-on but it is what it is, Walillahi alhamdu wa minna. And uh, what we'll do is we'll continue to educate. You could, you could, you could have Ad Hanuman's attack against me. You could criticize me. I've got no problem with that. But it's just now the hypocrisy that I'm highlighting. So as I said, attack me as much as you want. I don't care. You know, it's, 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 I've, I've had these videos consecutively, consistently made against me for years upon years. And three years, in fact. So I'm pretty much desensitized to it now uh, which is a god honest truth but when i see your hypocrisy i just laugh and shrug it off so take care of yourselves until the next video والموت يطلبني ما أحلم الله عني حيث أمهلني وقد تماديت في ذنب ويسترني تمر ساعة 